This is, this is, this is. Here we are, Music Monday. What's up, you punk rockers? Brand new episode for you. I got a bunch lined up. I'm really excited about this one. So let's get to it. Um, if you want to call in the show, the number is 360-830-6660. Call me up. Leave me a, va- a voicemail, a message right there, and let me know what you want me to talk about. Let me know if you have a question, a comment, uh, a topic. I love topics because you can just kind of go for a while. So um, anyway... Call in, let's do this. Uh, MXPX is going to be live July 1st in Trois Rivières. I don't know how to say that exactly. My French is not very good. It is it is not très bien. It's not muy bien. That's Spanish. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to be at Festa Voix in, uh, in Quebec. In Quebec. So the town is uh, tre- it's Three Rivers, Quebec, uh, which is outside of Montreal. We're headlining Saturday night. Come on out. It's going to be awesome. Festivois. Let's go. Um, and then um, later on September, we're going to be at, at, uh, in Birmingham. Burmi- is it Birmingham or is it Birmingham? I don't really know. Birmingham, Alabama, September 22nd at Furnace Fest, Friday night. Woo! More on that later. I, I know I've said eventually I'm going to do an episode about Furnace Fest and I'll have somebody somebody on a guest on and we'll talk about it but uh not ready to do that yet maybe sometime this summer i don't know we'll see um anyway we'll be there um and then october 21st and 22nd in las vegas nevada we're gonna be playing when we're young fest can't wait for that it's gonna be cool um a lot more good stuff happening before then though ah it's gonna be good all right Let's get to, we got a, a good episode for you guys, so let's get to it. Um, MXPeaks.com, working on some new, new uh, yes, new music too, but working on some new merch items, so maybe look around for that. We got some stuff in clearance as, as well, so if you maybe just don't want to spend so much money, maybe uh, just look over there, look at the clearance items at MXPeaks.com. Whatever you guys do, I always appreciate it. You guys are amazing. You guys are the reason I am here still doing this today. So thank you. All right. Let's get to this. You know, this next thing, I wanted to do a Music Monday. And uh, there's, there's been some submissions on the My Career Podcast Facebook group. If you're not part of that Facebook group, please come join. Uh, it's, it's, getting, uh, it's getting busier and busier every week. And I kind of love to see that. So thank you guys for, for joining me over there. If you're on all of the other socials, all good too. I'm on uh, Instagram, my career podcast. I'm on Twitter, my career pod. Um, and then of course my personals, you can follow me there too. And uh, if you're a fan of MXPX, I hope you're following us on social media. Yes, we've been, we've been kind of quiet lately, but that's because we're just catching our breath, doing stuff, making things happen. You know what I'm saying? Um, all right, you guys, let's get to this episode. Like I said, music Monday. And of course, we're going to do voicemails as well. But we're going to get started with Music Monday right now. Now, this first, this first Music Monday submission isn't even a band. It's a festival. But because they have a lot of, uh, I don't know, a lot of uh, focus on the community. They have a lot of focus on independent punk bands. I, I just kind of liked the idea of it. And I wanted to make sure that I talked about it so here we go let's get going punks in the park is a benefit concert in oregon that benefits at-risk youth trying to prevent homelessness and help youth we do this by putting on a live punk concert at the skate park oh i love that it's a skate park that's rad i know this is near and dear to you mike so i thought i'd let you know what punk rock is doing to help our community i would love to tell you more not asking mx peaks to play the show or anything but hey any shout outs to get the word out and support is appreciated. Thanks for all you do, man. More info on our page. All right. So uh, last year, they say that was their first year, and they served over 300 meals to at-risk youth and had 1,000 people in attendance, which is amazing for an independent nonprofit just put on a punk show. Having 1,000 people, that's great. Well done, everybody. Uh, back to it. We partnered with 30 local resource organizations to bring the resources to the youth that's so cool that people are are part of that um 
I just wanted pe people to know, you know, if you're in Salem, Oregon, you're somewhere near Salem, Oregon, uh, maybe you want to be part of that because that sounds like a very, very cool event that if it was anywhere near me, I'd be wanting to check out. So uh, shout out to Punks in the Park. I hope it goes well this year and uh, much love to you guys. Thanks for listening to the podcast too. All right, now let's get into the more traditional traditional uh, music Mondays. So the first band is going to be the Jack Knives. They wrote us, uh, I don't know, a couple weeks ago. I just didn't get to it till now. So let me, let me find it. All right, here we are. Uh, New Music Monday submission. Hi, Mike. Here's our submission for New Music Monday. We are the Jack Knives from Orange County, California. We've released two home recorded records in the past few years and are now recording our first professional record. This first single is called Are You Listening? And will be released on June 2nd. You guys are the first to hear it. All right, you guys, this is coming out June 2nd. The song's called Are You Listening? The Jack Knives. Cool, cool. Hey, uh, that's a good start, man. I mean, I can tell you guys are having a good time. You're having fun. I saw your little video that you posted um, in the studio. Man, all right. Good job, guys. It's, it sounds cool. Sounds cool. I like, I like right when it starts, right when you start singing, um, something about the bodies or whatever. Uh, <laughs> that caught me. That was a cool, a cool, uh, cool little first verse there. So uh, well done, guys. I wish you luck. June 2nd, it's coming out. So it'll be everywhere. Um, dig it. Orange County, California. All right, let's get to the next one. Hey, Mike and podcast listeners. Love the New Music Mondays. Wanted to showcase my old band, Saturday Matinee. I was definitely inspired by you guys growing up. And we even covered GSF and Chick Magnet regularly. We were a band 2004 to 2008 era. We did a quick reunion in 2020 to record a quarantine video inspired by Goldfinger. Love it. Here's the video. There, it's on our uh, the uh, the page. You can find it on the My Career Podcast Facebook page. Uh, we are still on Spotify with three albums and one is a pop punk Christmas EP. Thanks for all the great tunes over the years. Excited for the new album. Cool. So I just went over, clicked on the uh, clicked on the YouTube. Here we go. Your Saturday matinee, the song's called On the Corner of Botsford and Great Hill. The quarantine video. guys that's cool sorry i don't have a a, a, a nice fancy fade but 
All right, Saturday matinee. That was cool. That's like a classic pop punk sounding song. I love watching you guys doing the quarantine video thing. I'm sitting here. So if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll go ahead and I'll put some of these videos in if there's videos for these songs. If not, you can see my mug. But um, I dig it, man. Thanks for thanks for sub submitting. And I love that you guys made a quarantine video. It's very cool. All right, one more. All right, Northbound Breakdown. Let's go. Brian Wells wrote me. I'm going to read it. Here we go. Hey, Mike. Been listening to the show since the beginning. My favorite episode has to be the Gear Talk one with Tom. My last band, Younger Years, played with you at Auto Bar in Baltimore a bunch of Easter's ago, and I figured I should jump on the Music Monday train and share my new one. We're called Northbound Breakdown, still from Baltimore, a lot older, most of us have families, but still doing the East Coast melodic punk rock thing anytime we can. Very cool. Dude, I remember that show, um, Auto Bar, Baltimore. I think it was a solo show I did. Um, I can picture it. I remember talking to you. There's a, there was like a lot of chain link fences around. I don't know why. Um, anyway, thanks for submitting, Brian. Always uh, good to hear from you. I, I know who you are. And, and I, I even remember talking to you. I think it was our 25th year show. No, 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 no. Yeah. Somewhere in Philadelphia. Um, maybe that was our 20th. I don't know. 25th. It was 25. I remember talking to you there too. Anyway, let's play this band. Let's play this band. Northbound Breakdown. Let me find this thing. Um, this song's called Breaking the Second Wind. These gemstones, they shine so clear. Fitting in and out the road for 20 years. Then we got a second wind. They put our cards and told us to get right back in. It seems so long ago. We were still just kids. So cut up with our hearts. Yeah, I like it, man. I, I it, it starts kind of weird, but I like that you kind of are doing a different verse for each verse, and then, or maybe it's a different chorus. I'm not really sure, but uh, having heard it only really less than one time, because I haven't even heard the rest of the song, uh, I'm just making guesses. But yeah, it keeps you interested. It keeps you going. Like, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. And and I love just the, like the youthful lyrics about like sleeping on floors and not really not making any money, not knowing what your plans are, but you're just gonna live life and, and have fun with your friends and, and just keep going, right? Um, fading in and out, yeah, that's the thing. You know, we go, we, there's ups and downs. You go for a while, you, you you fail a bit and you come back up and something works out, but yeah, man, I'm right there with you. Yeah, Northbound Breakdown, cool. All right, I can tell you guys are having fun. I'm watching the video, It's just it's just good times, man. Um, thank you guys for submitting to Music Monday. Appreciate it. I hope you guys are enjoying this. And uh, let's keep it going. Every every now and again, I'll just do one of these Music Mondays. You know, of course, not every episode is going to be like this. Uh, but uh, I appreciate you guys sending in all this stuff. It's cool. All right, let's get to some voicemails. What do you guys say? What are you thinking? I'm going to make some voicemails happen here. Let's go with uh, number one. Let's see where we can uh, get to. Yo, what's up, Mike? How you doing, man? I'm Michael. I don't know what you prefer, but Michael here from Waterford, Connecticut. And I'm driving down the road right now, listening to the Secret Weapon album. And I was wondering about the line, sing it more like Eddie better. Someone from a label actually tell you that? Part of that? Did you pull that from the air? Or did someone maybe that you know who is on a label and in a band get told that. But, uh, yeah, first time calling, and that's my question. Love you, man. 
Thanks for all the great music. You're a baller. Thanks, Michael. You know, I don't mind either way. Michael, Mike, Miguel, Miguelito, whatever you want to call me. Um, Michael's nice, though. It makes me feel special, kind of. Mike makes me feel a little... Well, I'm very used to Mike. That's what I go by. But uh, it's kind of... It's pretty basic, you know? Mike. Mike. Basic. Like, this is a Mike. I'm a Mike. We're all different but the same you know so uh great question very simple question very very interesting that they kind of like huh i wonder what that so the song is they said sing it better something like play it better sing like eddie vetter um top of the charts that was a song let me just come out with it that was a song that I wasn't even sure if we should release because it sounded like we were complaining. But I just thought it was a cool song. You know, I just really liked the, the instrumentation, the, mo- the melody of it. Uh, the lyrics were just fun lyrics. It was meant to be a joke, really. Um, a little bit of cr- a critique on the music business and, and life. But um, now, to get to the crux of your question, did I pull that from the air? Kind of. <laughs> Let me explain. Um, Eddie, nobody told me to sing like Eddie Vedder exactly. But Eddie Vedder was the biggest band at the time. And, and you got to understand, growing up in Seattle, it was a Seattle thing. When you are growing up in Seattle and you're in music, um, ever since, ever since um, Pearl Jam, Nirvana, all of that stuff happened... All they do in Seattle is play throwback to Pearl Jam, throwback to Nirvana. It's Nirvana Nights. It's Pearl Jam year. I don't know. It's like every, it's like constantly grunge, you know? So, like, for me, it was just like a little commentary of, like, everybody wants us to sound like these grunge bands. But we're punk. We're a punk band. We're, we're, we're from Seattle. We're from Bremerton, Washington, specifically, but from the Seattle area and when people heard our music they always thought we were from California Los Angeles California San Diego California somewhere down Southern California but we always loved bands from Southern California Bad Religion Descendants that kind of stuff Rant, you know Rancid's not necessarily from Southern California but they were a California band um, that was our bread and butter you know like that's what we were into and doing this this punk rock thing, this pop, melodic punk rock thing um, in the Pacific Northwest, we were enemy number one. We were talked down about a lot, you know, because we didn't fit in with the other bands. So that's that was the sentiment, was just, you don't fit in, change your sound so that we can sell some records. Let's go. Um, I hope that explains it. So it's it's not that I plucked it out of thin air, but it was a metaphor for just the general vibes that we had been getting over the years. All right. Cool, cool, cool. Thanks, Michael. And, um, you know, you make me want to go by Michael. You make me want to go by Michael instead of Mike sometimes, but I feel like uh, it's too late for me now. All my, you know, my Twitter handle is Mike Herrera TD, uh, which is like till death in case you were wondering. Um, that's my name. So I don't think I'll be changing it. Although, Michael is also my name, so they wouldn't be changing it. All right, let's go to the next one. Here we go. Hey, Mike, it's uh, Shane or McCauley calling from uh, Toronto, Ontario. Um, I've been thinking about this for a week, and I just could not think of the song. Uh, I think it's on a B-side VHS tape I used to have, and um, I could not think of the song. And all of a sudden, I was thinking, of, I, I was listening to one of my own podcasts, and um, my my host said something about, where do we go when it's over? And it hit me. That song, where do we go when it's over? You had a clip of where do we go when it's over, and you had a bunch of, you know, old videos of, of the band coursing around, playing maybe a minute and a half of where do we go when it's over. And I love that song. 
Um, I don't think that track ever made it onto any of your albums, but uh, I always really love that 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 song, and I'm I'm wondering why it never really made any of the albums. Um, I would love to hear you guys play it live or or uh, you know streaming it. Uh, yeah, where I think it's I think it's called "Where Do We Go When It's Over." Um, but yeah, that's one of my my all time favorite songs. Um, I've been digging around the internet for it. Um, I'd love to hear your uh, thoughts about it and uh, why it never made a real uh, album cut. Uh, thanks so much, uh, fan for uh, almost twenty four years now. Cheers, Mike. Shane, what's up, dude? That's a that's a great question. Um, where will we go? That's the song. Where will we go? It's called that. We released an acoustic version of that song on the ACEP, I think. And but before that, we recorded it with Jerry Finn during the Ever Passing Moment session. Didn't make the album, and we put it on the Japanese import of the ever passing moment so you can find it there and then i'm trying to think of what video you're talking about because maybe it was on a video um i don't know if it was on a video i don't remember it being on a video does anybody does anybody else listening do you remember it being on a video because i don't really remember it being on a video i remember there was uh uh there was another song on um the beginning of the beginning of either move to bremerton or b movie there was another b-side intro song that that people were obsessed with for a while and that was called let's keep a beat also never made it onto any albums um but where will we go that's a song we played for sure at least one time during our between this world sorry but yeah between this world and the next live stream live on the internet shows at our studio um i have no idea when but I, I do remember playing that song recently and so yeah now and again we'll play it I, I don't know we'll be doing it in any festival shows or anything like that but um yeah we could bring it back at a live stream for sure um that's a song that i really dig i, I still dig that song i don't know why it never made a record i think it was just it's kind of nostalgic in a weird personal way that maybe we didn't want out there too much i guess because it was like we don't want people to think about us being done we you know because we're just getting started you know we're we're still working on it like like um why we don't overly do nostalgia type stuff you know a lot of bands do you know, their their most popular album and they'll do all their albums, things like that. The reason why we don't do that is is because we're still trying to do m new music. And when you do that kind of stuff, it tells people that you're a nostalgia act. You're like Motley Crue, basically, you know, something like that. So at some point, MXPX probably will be a nostalgia act. But for right now, we're still making new music. We're still putting out new material. And so you, we don't want to be a nostalgic act. We just want to be an act. We're an act. That's what we do. We play music. We record me. We write and record music. We play it. Love it. So, I don't know. I'm just kind of talking out my ass a little bit, but um, that's kind of the thought right now on on uh, nostalgia. Nostalgia acts. Now, nostalgia is a beautiful thing. It's a, a lovely thing. I'm not saying I don't love it because I do. I'm just saying that uh, you know you don't want to put yourself in the corner like. You, nobody puts baby in the corner, so why would you put yourself in the corner, right? That's all I'm saying. All right. I hope you find it. Um, where will we go? It's on the internet. It's on YouTube, but it, it, the one I found was a pretty bad-sounding audio. Um, I'm sure there's a better one out there, but we can all help each other out and, and find it and post it on the, the Mike Herrera Podcast Facebook group. All right. Let's get to another another voicemail. Hey, Mike, my name's Seth. Um, just wanted to say that I'm a huge fan of you and MXPX. Um, I remember first listening to you back in the 90s, 
you guys were on a uh, tooth and nail like video sampler and uh it was a money tree so that's really what got me into punk rock uh, i know you guys have worked with a lot of producers over the years um for your records um I just wanted to get your take on Jerry Finn. I know he produced the Ever Passing Moment. Um, I know that he was, you know, huge in, in the punk rock scene, and he was a beloved producer. And um, I just wanted to get your take on how he influenced that record and how he influenced you and uh, MXPX. Thanks, uh, and I'm going to be listening. Have a good day. See ya. Thanks, Seth. Thanks for uh, calling in. So last week on the podcast episode 457 um it, it looks like it's all about glenn danzig and tw it's called 20 eyes on my pod i talk about horror punk i talk about a bunch of stuff but i talk a lot about recording sessions some of my favorite recording sessions and one of my favorite actually my favorite recording session was probably the ever passing moment and i talk a lot about it last week but i'm gonna go ahead and talk about it this week again since we're all here and I'm sure I'll say something completely different so working with Jerry was great uh, we started working with him up in Seattle at Robert Lang Studios we did the drums we maybe did a little bass but we may, mainly just did drums up there we took about two weeks to do it um, had a great time he has so many like weird jokes and stories along the way he's just a fun person or was a fun person to be around and um you know the, the 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 thing i remember about the seattle session is where am the gas hole so they were kind of like making fun of of uh, our our studio assistant who was like the guy that worked at the studio and he was kind of a mouth breather totally nice guy but really out of his element didn't know as much didn't know enough about recording and about studios to really be doing what he was doing on the, on the session, you know. Anyway, <laughs> they would kind of like make fun of him, and be like, "Where am the gas hole?" Like, <sighs> and just like acting like this guy was like the most hick person from the woods, you know. The thing, you know, because we're out here in Washington, and they're from L.A., they're from Hollywood, and uh, I felt like, you know, Jerry felt like he was in the sticks, and and I'm sure he. You know, back in those days, he didn't do a lot of work outside California. You know, he was mostly staying down in L.A., maybe New York. But um, we brought him up to Seattle. <laughs> That's great. So anyway, we did about two weeks there. And, and uh, we went to Conway Studios on, off Santa Monica Boulevard in Hollywood. And we were staying at... We were staying at the Cokewoods, which is the, the, the place where a lot of actors and musicians would stay on the lower end of the budget, apartments that were for, for industry people. So they were called the Oakwoods, but we all called them the Cokewoods because people would just be tweaked out, partying all the time living there for months and months at a time while you're on set doing a movie, doing a TV show, in our case, recording an album. Um, so, I mean, I feel like we got a lot of those, those Hollywood experiences and, 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 you know, show business experiences on this session for sure. Uh, I mentioned this last week. Jerry lived right up, right across the street from the Sky Bar, like the Mondrian Hotel, um, which is... Real close to say, um, the, the Hyatt on Sunset, um, the heart, uh, the the House of Blues that no longer exists where it is, you know, where it was. But the House of Blues used to be right on Sunset there in Hollywood, and he lived right across the street, up a hill, in the Hollywood Hills, right there. And we'd just go party at his house after going out to the bar. Go to, the, we'd go to the, he'd get us into the the uh, sky bar, things like that. Um, it was a good time. You know, we had a lot of new experiences um, during that session in particular. But the session, the session itself was amazing. We had, we had so, many, um, so many people stopping by, saying hi. Um, Neil Young stopped, stopped in, not to say hi to us, but <laughs> he was doing some work with Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And he brought, he had driven down this like old, 
I don't know, 1950s hot rod, street rod, street rod type car down from the Bay Area. And, and we were all like looking at it and he was telling us about it. And um, I, I wouldn't say that I'm friends with, with Neil Young, but he was a nice guy at the time back then. Um, and then, you know, like, I think the Millen Collin guys stopped by for a minute. Um, they had stopped by, you know, during life in general, but then they stopped by again on the ever passing moment. And, uh, always cool to see those dudes. Um, the Foo Fighters taught us how to do beer bongs and, uh, Dave Grohl brought a beer bong and he's like, guys, this is a beer bong. Let's do this. Blah, blah, blah. We were doing it. Tom Snesky puked in the trash can next to him, next to, next to us as we were doing beer bongs. Mm -hmm. Couldn't take it. But it was like the beginning of a new era because from then on for like at least six, seven years, we had a beer bong on tour with us everywhere we went. Beer bong, like a funnel with a tube. And you, you pour the beer in and you put the tube in your mouth and you go, and it's just right in and you're done. I haven't done a beer bong in a long time. <laughs> I'm drinking a lot of beer, but I haven't done a beer bong in a long time. Um, but the session itself was great. You know, we recorded all the two-inch tape. No Pro Tools back then. Uh, we, ha we still hadn't recorded to Pro Tools yet, ever. Um, still, when we recorded the Everpassing Moment. So, um, after that was between, you know, oh, before, before everything and after. That album was our first album recording to Pro Tools. So, but back to the, the Everpassing Moment. Um, certain days, you know, Mike Fasano was doing our drum teching, who he's the drummer of, 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 um, a really great rockabilly punk band. And I'm, I'm spacing the name. Uh, it's on the tip. I haven't even thought about them in so long, but you guys would know Mike Fasano is the drummer, but, um, anyway, he, uh, you know, there's so many cool little stories, but he would always come in and and just do funny like pranks on us, um, jazz chords, jazz chords. It, it, I, I don't want to tell you about jazz chords because I would have to show you. And if I showed you, um, this video would be banned from YouTube and my, my page might even get banned from YouTube. So I'm not going to show you. Uh, but I bet you want to know what are the jazz chords? Well, we may never know. But Mike Fasano uh, was dating one of the girls that was the manager of the studio. And, and then the other girl was like f her friend. And we would just all have these barbecues. And like Mike would go out and get a bunch of barbecues. Like his girlfriend would give him money, like studio money, like crazy, crazy budget, I guess. And we'd just get all this beer, all this food. And us and the Foo Fighters and whoever else was there would always have like these, these parties and these barbecues. Um, and we got some recording done now and again as well. But one last thing I'll say about it, about Jerry Finn in particular, aside from him being a great guy, um, his producing style was very laid back. He really just let us do what we wanted to do. And if it was too much, he would be like, maybe just do that half as many times or take, take that out a little bit or something like that. But he didn't really, he wasn't really a hard ass when it came to producing. Uh, always had, always had a smile on his face, was always, was always uh, social, you know, was never grumpy, really. So he was a, a great guy, and, and I miss him. I, I do miss him, for sure. Um, man, there's so many little, little snippets and things, you know. But, um, yeah, Jerry was, Jerry was awesome. He was great. We worked with him again on a song... Um, it was the Empire. It was for the the soundtrack for that movie. Um, but the song was called The Empire, and Mark Hoppus came in and sang. And we recorded it at a different studio. We recorded it at at uh, Cello in Hollywood, which is a really nice studio, a place where a lot of other pretty big producers mix. Um, but uh, after that, you know, we. We, you know, a couple of years later, I don't know how many years later, I don't know, but um, he passed away. He had a an aneurysm and a, like a 
some sort of, you know, like a stroke type type thing. It was an aneurysm that, that goes in your brain, like a blood clot goes into your brain. And he was in a coma for a while and he passed from that. So it was it was so so sad, so shocking, surreal, just didn't feel real. It was it was you know, you spend so much time with somebody day in and day out and um you know, this guy was the type of guy that kind of had his his life was comfortable. It was good. Like he had his house up in the Hollywood Hills. He could, he, what he liked to do, he liked to start around noon. So we'd start working at noon because his mornings were all his personal time. So he would get up, run errands, pay bills, do laundry, go to the grocery store, do whatever it is that people do with their, you know, days. And then... 12 on, we'd be recording, and we wouldn't be done until like 9, 10, 11, something like that. Sometimes we'd break for the barbecues, things like that, like I was saying. Sometimes we'd go from there straight to a club, straight to dinner, straight to a bar, whatever it was. We were pretty busy. And sometimes Jerry would come with us, sometimes he would not. But um, but for the most part, he he kind of had his routine, you know, so when he... So you, you really know a guy, you know, when you're spending that much time with him. You, you knowing what he's doing throughout his days and you're like hanging and you're you're telling stories back and forth and you know, and a couple of years later he's he's gone and it's just it's strange. It's it's wild. And and that happens. That's that's part of life, you know. Uh let's do let's do a couple more. Let's do a couple more. But that you know, Jerry Finn, that's that's a chapter of MXPX that was uh just pure gold. We we really learned a lot and uh, loved every minute of it. So we love you, Jerry. We love you. All right, let's move on. Let's do. Let's do. We got two more. Two more voicemails. Here's the second to last. What up, Mike? This is uh, Luke from Santa Barbara, California. Currently residing in the South Town, San Diego, California. And I, I've been meaning to call forever in, and, and, and but I'm definitely excited. I'm I'm finally doing it now. Long time uh, listener, first time caller. So you know, I, I'm I'm sitting here in my living room, uh, looking at my two frame posters that I absolutely love. It's it's of MXPX, Five Iron Frenzy, Dogwood at the Ventura Theater in uh, here in California, Ventura, California. And you know, I, I don't think I've heard you you talk about it. And, and my apologies if I if you did. But I, I wanted to hear kind of your 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 thought and the process behind the tour posters. I mean, it's it's my favorite artwork in the house. My wife, who's not a fan at all, but absolutely loves the the beautiful artwork that you do. And there's other bands that that do some stuff like Newfound Glory's done some great stuff, and Blink Twenty Two's done some awesome stuff that I've collected as well. But MXPX is always that constant. Even when thinking back to um, you know the online shows, you doing some posters for that. Uh, between this world and next, like amazing. And I just want to think of, ask you about the process, what goes into it, timeline, uh, artwork, the artist, uh, anything you can remember about like the, the tour posters, concert posters. Um, I would love to learn about it, man. I'm a huge fan of them, huge fan of the band. And anything you can share, uh, I, I would definitely appreciate it. Uh, that's my dog in the background, Samson. He's an English bulldog, so sorry about that, brother. But uh, thanks again, Mike. Keep Keep the pod going, brother. And a uh, huge fan again of MXPX, man. Thank you again. What up, what up? Thanks, Luke. San Diego, that's right. Um, I'm trying to remember those shows. Yeah, that was a couple years ago. Um, posters, though. So the posters, really, you know, we are lucky. MXPX is so lucky that we have the Poconacha Punk. Our mascot, our guy, our main man, the Poconacha Punk, he really really adds to the whole package of what we do and that makes our job a little easier it really does and, and so we decided to do some posters you know for these shows the shows were going so well it's like what else can we do let's let's do something that people can remember how fun it is and i feel like a poster is just something other than a t-shirt you know and some people love to get a tour t-shirt some people don't want a tour t-shirt they want a tour poster and so that's that's the, really the main reason is just offering what people want. Now, you know, after a while, maybe people are like, okay, I'm done with posters, so maybe eventually we'll stop making those. Um, but as long as people want them, we want to be we want to be providing those. Now, the process of making those uh, it could go so many different ways, but um, you know, 
basically, you know, it started out as like, I would do a poster for like, so our Bremerton poster from years ago, 2000, I want to say it was 2015 or 16, 17, somewhere in there. We played the Admiral Theater in Bremerton, Washington. And it was like, oh, let's have the Poconaccio Punk as a giant. And he's like over the Admiral Theater, you know, just looking cool. And that was kind of like, one of the first ideas that I had with the Poconaccio Punk being a, a, a character that was a little bit outside itself, like it's the Poconaccio Punk, but it's also the Poconaccio Punk being somebody. And that kind of just snowballed into where you see the San, the San Diego poster in particular is um, is uh, is um, the Poconaccio Punk as the newscaster um, in, um, what is that? Um, Keep it classy, San Diego. What's the, whatever the newscaster movie is. I can't even remember. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. So that was the idea for like that San Diego poster. And then that, um, that Ventura poster, I think, was a Shark Jaws poster, uh, if I remember correctly. And that was just another, like, what can we do? It's like, so I'm just thinking of, like, other posters we've done. It, it was always like, okay, Disneyland. We're in Anaheim, California at the House of Blues, that's all owned by Disney. We're right next to Disneyland. Let's do a Disney-themed Poconaccio Punk poster, you know? And, and so that's, the, you know, that's the basics. It's not a, a real complicated situation. It's just, let's come up with the best idea we can. And then once we morphed onto those sort of like some, sometimes it's a movie character, or a movie on a poster. Um, and then from there, we've gone into between this world and the next, which was, our own world. It wasn't us uh, doing a parody of something. It was us creating a new world, a new look, a new vibe. And I love that too because it's a similar artwork, but it's it's not something that you're seeing from a movie. It's like brand new. So it's good to do both and it's good to do more than both. It's good to just keep going and keep moving and keep changing and keep developing those ideas and that's what we're doing as far as artwork uh artists we've had three four five different artists over the last five years probably doing these posters of course the poconaccio punk originally drawn by john nissen he's the og um he he uh you know we definitely still work with john but when it comes down to these posters it's almost like outside of what he does he's he's very much the best at drawing the Poconaccio Punk. But when it comes to doing the Poconaccio Punk here, 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 it's all so much that we need somebody that can kind of come come on the side and be like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take what you've done, John, and I'm gonna add to that. And so artists, of course, you know, they get busy, they get popular, they get they get new jobs doing other things. So we, we're constantly having to find new artists to do this stuff. It's never uh, you find somebody and you keep them. I mean, sometimes it is. I mean, we had, we've had we've worked with people over and over and over for many, many years. But when it comes to producers and it comes to artwork, uh, artists, um, it, it's, we seem to switch it up a little bit now and again. But I think it's just because people can't keep, we, one, people can't do everything, you know, the same person because... People got to live their lives. They got to they gotta eat. They got to sleep. But MXPX, no, we don't. We just keep going. So we just got to find people to work with and keep going. And that's what's worked with us. So I hope you guys, and I'm glad that you've enjoyed the posters. It's, that's cool. MXPX.com, we probably have a few of those posters um, on clearance because when we have uh, leftover posters, we put them up at, in MXPX.com. We put them up in the store. Um, and they usually go pretty quick, but we haven't been playing any shows lately, so there's a few, there's a few there that uh, probably just fell through the cracks. So, be my guest. Go check it out. All right, thanks, Luke. Let's do one more voicemail, and then we will we'll wrap it up. Thank you guys for calling in. All right, here we go. Hey, Mike, it's uh, Danes calling from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Um, I'm wondering if you could. Uh, Tell us what it was like recording with Stephen Edgerton. Um, I know you recorded something on his solo record, um, that whole process. From what I understand, he wrote and recorded all the music, then sent uh, songs to certain 
buddies and some of his favorite vocalists to uh, write lyrics and uh, record their parts, send it back to him, he mixed it, and it ended up on his album, uh, Seven Degrees of Stephen Ederson. Uh, it's a great album. Um, I just heard your song the other day again for the first time in a while and uh, thought I'd give a call and wonder if you could tell everybody about that whole process. Cheers, man. See ya. Yeah. Dude, that's funny. Danes, well, thanks for uh, calling from Nova Scotia. Um, dude, that's a perfect topic to end on because we were just talking about Jerry Finn. Now we can talk about Stephen Edgerton. So this happened later. This happened after Jerry. Um, I started working with Stefan, you know, we've, we've been friends since 97, uh, met them on the Warp Tour and then just hung out all the time on Warp Tour. Um, and then here we are. So Stefan asked me to sing on his record and I did, I, but I had to write the song. I had to write the lyrics. So he didn't just give me the whole song and say, all right, sing this. He gave me an instrumental track and said, all right, here's the song. T- I, th- I, I, I don't remember if he gave me the song title or if I had to write everything completely, but either way, if he gave me the song title, he gave me the title, cut me down to size, and then I had to write all the lyrics. So I remember I was in my basement. So there's, um, there's a video for the song Gray Skies Turn Blue, off, and it's the acoustic version off of the ACEP. Now, that video, there's a part, there's a lot of parts where I'm singing like as if I'm recording. Well, I'm singing in that little basement room of my old house. I used to live there 10, over 10 years ago in the Manette area of Bremerton, the Manette house. Anyway, so I was in the basement in my little studio room. It wasn't really a studio. It was a songwriting room. I just sit in there and, and write songs. It's the same room I was in when I wrote this, the, the lyrics to cut me down to size. And I just remember going, listening to the song, what I would do, what I do when I write lyrics for other people's songs that I'm not part of, or that I didn't write previously. And I do this, I do this with, with um, Goldfinger a little bit too. Uh, if John sends me a, you know, a finished track and says, hey, can you write a verse for this? I'll figure out the song. Now with Goldfinger, obviously I'm already playing the bass on that, but with this, with uh, Stefan's album, I wasn't playing any instruments, I'm just singing. So I had to f- figure out the song and I play it on acoustic and I start singing the melody. So I just start coming up with with lyrics. I don't know, I don't know how, but <laughs> I just do. Um, Cut me down to size. I, I'm proud of those lyrics too. I was I was happy how they came out, and it didn't seem like a struggle at all when they just flowed out of me. And I recorded the lyric. I recorded the you know my voice, and I remember it felt good. It felt good to get that down, and 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 I felt like okay, this is a strong track. Now there's so many good songs on that record. You know my track is just a track, right? It's just a track. But um, but I'm telling you, if you if you dig if you dig uh, The Descendants and if you dig MXPX, check out Cut Me Down to Size because it's a little mash between the two. Very cool. It's me singing Stefan's song. Um, Stefan's still, you know, he, those guys those guys are all rad, but Stefan's definitely the, the, the one I'm closest with. Um, having just spent so much time with him and over the years, they've, you know, Stefan toured with us as a tech. He was my bass tech. He was our monitor tech, you know. So... Um, I love him. I love him to death. All right. Um, that, that album cut me down to size, the song, but the album is called um, Seven, Separ- is it Seven Separations of Stephen Edgerton. Um, <laughs> I, don't know what, I don't know what it is. It's like, yeah, it's something like that. Yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm sure I'm getting that a little, little wrong, but I just recorded that in, you know, by myself and sent it off to him and, and uh, the rest is history. All right, you guys, that's uh, Music Monday and a lot of extra, a lot of recording stories and I hope you guys enjoyed this week. MXPeaks.com for merch. We've got some posters up there. we got some t-shirts. we got hoodies, of course. I think we have this hoodie, moments like this. We have this in a hoodie. We have this uh, in a t-shirt, in a different color t-shirt. But this is uh, one of my solo, 
solo designs. All right, you guys. Bob McKnight, shout out. Thanks for producing. Thanks for doing what you do, man. I, I love you, and I appreciate you. Um, make sure you guys uh, subscribe to the podcast if you aren't already. Just like or star or heart on whatever platform you're listening on. I'd really appreciate it. All right. That's about it for me. See you next week. Peace out. <laughs>